Good morning, friends. Good morning. Got some room in here today. Yeah, well, we are of two congregations. We get the women's retreat happening, so we'll be praying for them. And I've, I've heard great things uh, uh, from them this weekend. So welcome to Shepherd of the Sierra Presbyterian Church. Glad that you are here today. It's cool. It's going to rain today, right? Yeah. Glad that you are also with us online. As a note of something that we're trying to do and do a little bit differently, please put any prayer requests in big letters, caps, online so I can check that and we can pray uh, at communion. Also, please fill out those uh, blue cards so we can pray during communion for the things that you are joyful and concerned about this week. As a way of settling ourselves into this worship time, I invite you to take a deep breath uh, to try to consider the, the things that you brought into this place and attempt to let go of them so that we might attend to ourselves and the God with whom we worship this morning. We light the Christ candle, remembering that Jesus Christ is with us always. Good morning, SOS Church family. <laughs> Good to see you all. Uh, please stand and join me in the call to worship. Let us praise God who is steadfast in love. Let us <clears throat> May we set our minds and hearts on the love of God. Please join me in the call to confession. Jesus Christ gave us one rule to follow. Love God, neighbor, and self. We, however, have other purposes. Let us confess our cross purposes in order to live with more intention and integrity. <clears throat> Please join me in the prayer of confession. We are very religious, O oh God. We are devoted and dedicated to much more than you. We serve our self-interest and sense of self-worth. We listen to talking heads and tow to the party line. We give ourselves to over to boost our bank accounts. We pledge allegiance to much before your son, Jesus Christ. We are loyal to much and little to you. Turn us toward you in this worship silence that we might follow you with more devotion and dedication. Now please take a moment for silent confession.
Hear now the assurance of forgiveness. We might waver, but God does not. We may lack loyalty, but God is faithful. We might be untrustworthy, but God never falters. Even though we serve many purposes, God is steadfast in love. Friends, hear and believe the good news. Friends, now we offer the peace that we feel within our hearts and in our minds to one another, knowing that Jesus Christ is with us and among us. Let us warmly welcome one another with an elbow bump, a fist bump, a handshake, a hug, whatever is comfortable for you. Good morning. I'd like to invite the children to join me up front here for our time together. They're coming. <laughs> Hi, guys. All right, so I was asking, come on, have a seat. I was asking a few people this morning if anybody's doing a sport this fall. Is anybody playing soccer? Yeah, playing soccer? Okay, how about in the, sp in the winter and spring, do you ever play baseball or t-ball? Any of you ever done that? A little bit, okay. There's lots of different games, maybe basketball. Sometimes we play basketball um, at home with a basketball hoop in our yard or something, or we may, might play on a team. Well, I was thinking about the way that we practice some things, right? So when we're playing soccer, we don't sign up for soccer and then just show up for the big championship game. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? We have little things we have to do all along the way. We have to practice, right? So we go to practice a few days a week and we dribble the ball and we learn to pass it with our feet. And if we're the, the goalkeeper, we learn to block it and um, we learn how to throw it in. And if we're doing basketball, we practice dribbling so we don't lose control, right? And when you want to score points, what do you do with basketball? You shoot it, that's right. And it's really hard to shoot that ball and get it in the basket, right? So we have to practice over and over. We have to do all these little things before we get to the big game, right? We can't just show up for the big game or we wouldn't know what we were doing. 
I was also thinking about the way some of you have returned to school, and any of you ever practiced writing letters when you were learning to write letters? Does that look familiar? Yeah? We practice, we write them, we write them, we write them, we fill in the blanks, we add some letters. So imagine if on your first day of school, your teacher said, today, I want you to write a book. But you had never written any letters before. That'd be kind of a lot, wouldn't it? We would have to sometimes practice these little things in order to do those bigger things. And so our whole lives, we spend time practicing and practicing and practicing so that when we get to those big things, we're ready. In today's scripture, Jesus is going to tell a story, and it's a pretty complicated story. And so um, when you listen to it, I want you to listen for one line in particular. And Jesus talks about the little things and the big things and when we can be trusted to do the little things and when we can be trusted to do the big things. And I want you to remember this idea of practicing, that when we do little things in life, we're getting ready to do big things in life, right? And that we can't just jump into the big things and we can't be trusted to do the big things if we've never even done the little things, right? That's an important idea. And that really applies to our faith. Um, In fact, we talked in Sunday school this morning about practicing our faith, right? Those ways that we show that we love God and that we serve God by praying and by taking care of people. And we can't just say, someday I'll do that, right? But we have to practice those little things every day so that we grow in our faith. All right, let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you um, that you have um, trusted us to do your good work here on earth. We ask that you help us to practice these things our whole lives long, um, to practice all these little things that we do each day um, to show that we love you so that when we have um, big things in our lives, we're ready and we can follow you. Um, Be with us in this time as we continue to listen to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I will meet all of you over in the corner if you wish to come and color quietly with me. And if you have prayer requests this morning, you can um, hold those up on the blue cards and pass them to the aisles. The ushers will collect them from you. And then also, um, I will be keeping the children a little bit of extra time this morning, so at the end of the sermon, they won't come directly back to you unless they are choosing to. Um, We'll keep them there through the moment for mission. All right. Thank you, Kathy. It really is a complicated story we have today, so let's dig into it. Let's pray. God, help us to understand uh, what you have to say to us on this uh, morning through this uh, parable that Jesus tells. Help us to be more faithful in little, and so we may be more faithful in much. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We are finding ourselves today in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly, for the children of this age are more shrewd in, the, in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone they may welcome you into the eternal homes. 
Whoever is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with your dishonest wealth, who will entrust you or entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So ends the reading. A family frequents a restaurant because it's quick and convenient. But then one of them reads an article linked on Facebook that details how management mistreats employees. What do they do? Do they stop eating at the restaurant? A woman contributes to the campaign of a candidate who ends up acting against her best interests. What can she do? Write a letter? A lifelong fan proudly wears the jersey until they hear that the player named on their back is embroiled in several personal and professional scandals. What do they do? Give up their allegiance? A man often purchases supplies at a retailer until he's told one Sunday in the narthex that the company donates to harmful organizations. What is he to do? Travel farther and pay more for his items? A woman is told by her walking partner that the shoes she is wearing is made in sweatshops. Friends, what should she do? Ditch them in a donation bin? These Modern ethical conundrums are also ancient ones. We heard one offered, to G- offered by Jesus this morning. Here's the, how the story goes, told from another uh, viewpoint. Jesus says that a man is contracted to cultivate an olive tree farm. And according to the contract agreement, he must return about 100 jugs of oil to the owner of the farm. One day, the manager of the farm comes by to tell him that he now only owes half. So the man is pleased. He's going to profit from all of this. Later, however, he finds that the manager changed the contract terms without telling the owner. What is he supposed to do? Honor the original contract? And a similar thing happens to a wheat farmer. The manager cuts the bill, unbeknownst to the landowner. And so these two farmers, they are caught up in a shady deal. What are they to do? Jesus reminds his disciples that this is the world in which they live. They live in a world where a property manager mishandles an owner's estate, gets fired for it, renegotiates estate contracts before leaving, and then is praised by the owner for doing so. The disciples live in a world that is so enamored by wealth and the means to attain it that people commend shrewdness over goodness, shrewdness over honesty, even when it is at their own expense. A businessman at the bad end of a sneaky deal admires the way in which he was taken advantage of. This is the way things work in this world, Jesus warns. People are unfaithful in much and in little, dishonest to many and few. They are untrustworthy with much and with little. And they are nonetheless praised for it because They all get a bit ahead. The disciples, they find themselves in a world governed by principles that Jesus opposes. 
They will have to discern how to act rightly when others have done wrong. They will wonder if they can be true when everybody else is dishonest and immoral. Is it possible to follow Jesus with integrity in a world that's gone another way? I think we can imagine ourselves as the olive tree or the the wheat farmer of Jesus' parable. We can imagine ourselves as these two people implicated in the manager's indiscretions. We can do so because we have certainly been in this kind of situation. These people get a good deal because the manager fleeced the owner. Haven't we all benefited from deals like this? A shirt? Sorry, that's my tie. A shirt? (laughs) Made inexpensive because it's outsourced to cheap labor? Food? Made affordable by factory farms that are cruel to animals and harmful to the poor communities they are often planted near? Products delivered quicker by corporations that ignore employee complaints, and environmental impact. Investments made in companies that will ensure our retirement, secure our retirement, but do dishonest business nonetheless. Many, if not most of us, have spent our money only to find that it has gone to people and businesses that act against our own principles. And realizing uh, realizing all of this, some of us, we go either way. Some divest, refuse to shop there, buy this or that. And others, we simply go on, resigning ourselves to the way things are. Friends, both are very reasonable responses to this ancient and modern dilemma. And Jesus offers his disciples... He offers us not so much a way out of this predicament, but a way to maintain some integrity in it. I think Jesus is a realist in this way. Elsewhere, he will say, give to Caesar his denarius, knowing that this tax is a means to suppress him and his people. Jesus realizes there just may be no way out of an economy of dishonesty. But we can remain honest in it. He gives us a little bit of a way we might do so. We can start by treating every financial decision, even the small ones, as an opportunity to be honest, trustworthy, and faithful. We start with the small because our principles are often most evident in the small things. We see the reverse in our story today. The manager in Jesus' parable is dishonest in all his financial affairs. His rule for life is wealth and the security of it by any means necessary. He is faithful to mammon, to wealth and provision. And this is evident in even his little dishonest dealings. So what principles are evident in our dealings, in our small and large purchases, in our giving, in our saving? Are we faithful to the principles of God or mammon, wealth? Jesus says it's one or the other. And Jesus defined the divine principle, the rule. He distilled some 613 rules of Hebrew scripture to just one. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. And this might seem like two principles, two rules, but Jesus makes clear that the love of neighbor is the love of God and that loving God and neighbor is the same expression This is the divine principle, the divine rule. Love God in others and others in God. 
just as we love ourselves. Put another way, as we seek what is good for ourselves, seek what is good for others and seek the good that is God. The manager reverses all of this, seeking only what is good for himself and everybody else is implicated in his decision. But there is another way, even in this dishonest economy. We can seek to love God, we can do good with all of our dealings, and we can start with the small gifts, our little purchases, and see how even in them we can love. Now, this is always more difficult than it sounds. To love God and neighbor, to seek what is good, to do good with even the small exchanges and our large expenses, all of this requires a great degree of intention. It means pausing at every single purchase in an economy that thrives on quick spending. It involves studying our budgets and being honest with ourselves about what kind of principles they reflect. And in doing this, I think we know what we'll find. We will find how easy it is to spend without any consideration of others. We will likely find that in this economy, in this world, shrewdness is always going to get us a lot farther than goodness. It may seem very impossible to love and live with integrity in the world as it is. but we lose nothing of worth in trying, right? Consider this, just as a spiritual practice. Just take stock of the small, even those relatively inconsequential purchases of ours, and discern how in them we love God, do good, or not. As a spiritual practice, We might consider the way that we spend money each day, each year, each month, however you do your financial business, and then wonder over all this, whether our finances reflect the love that we have for God, the love that we have for our neighbor. And in doing so, we're not going to aim at perfection. This is not about heaping guilt upon ourselves. Again, this is just an opportunity to love God, to do good in just the little things in our lives. As Jesus says, whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. So in a world where shrewdness is praised over goodness, where employers rob employees so that we can pay less, where people with platforms beg, buy this and not that, for this reason and not that, where we're meant to feel guilty for what we buy and who from, and in a world where every financial decision does matter. Seek to be faithful, and only a little. Faithful to loving God and loving all with something like our money. These small things that we do, the small ways that we love even by means of our bank accounts, this is how we maintain some integrity in a dishonest economy, in a wayward world. And maybe, just maybe, all the little things that we do will amount to much. Amen.
seated. <laughs> With an emphasis on the seated. <laughs> Please sign and pass the friendship pads and greet our new or unfamiliar people in your row. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Glory be to you, O God, for the gift of creation and its bounteous mercies. Praise be to you, O Christ, for redeeming love and the promise of new life. Thanks be to you, O Holy Spirit, for guidance, counsel, and abiding revelation. We honor and worship you in presenting our offerings. Take our lives and let them be consecrated. O God, to thee, amen. Hi, I'm Suzanne Sheets from the mission team, and I have a short message about the upcoming Peace and Global Witness offering that we officially collect on World Communion Sunday, which is October 2nd, the first Sunday in October. You can see from the slide, um, Isaiah 55, 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. I was, I was so happy when I saw that this was the Bible passage for promoting the Peace and Global Witness offering this year because uh, several years ago I was in a Bible, part of a Bible study that um, went for like a couple years studying Isaiah and I grew to love this book. I love the language, I love the poetry, and I especially love the message. Uh, of Isaiah's strong witness to care for those on the margins of community, the widow, the orphan, the prisoner, the stranger, the, the essence of what we've adopted as our Matthew 25 uh, commission, commitment. So um, there's a little uh, bulletin insert about this offering this Sunday. And it's one of four special offerings that the Presbyterian Church collects each year. These options are optional for each church. You can decide to collect, you know, each church can decide to collect none of them, one of them. We've uh, decided to collect all four. And actually, I think there's a certificate in the office that congratulates us on this uh, <laughs> decision. So, um, you go to the next slide, it's a little explanation about the, um, 
how the Presbyterian Church divides it up. It's also in the insert if you're kind of the kind of person who likes it written down for you. Um, 50% is sent to the Presbyterian Church for the um, mission, Presbyterian Mission Agency for uh, advocating for peace and justice. 25% uh, is given to the Northern uh, California, the North Central, they changed their name recently, the North Central California Presbytery, our Presbytery, for, um, to be used for peacemaking in our local con uh, local area, which is like from up in Redding down to Stockton. And uh, in the past years, they funded part, um, part of that Malatkia, guys who went can pronounce it better, uh, the Alaska mission trip. Uh, just this week, they informed us that they are sending us some money for use for the uh, mosquito fire victims. Um, and another 25% of it gets to stay with our congregation and we, the mission team, gets to decide what to do with it. So this year, the mission team took a lot of time, a thoughtful prayer, discernment about how to use this offering. We are all overwhelmed in the media with reports of violence, suffering, war, shootings, constant conflict. Uh, we discussed all these places that we could use this offering. And we decided to use it for something that doesn't get a lot of media attention. Um, with our relationship with the Boyds, who are our mission co-partners in Africa, we learned about a program called Reconcile Institute in South Sudan. And there's a little video, very short, that will talk about it. So, there it goes. Thank you, Vivian. To strengthen the church's ability to undertake peace-building initiatives, PCOS identifies community leaders to be trained at the International Resource Center for Civil Leadership, better known by its acronym, Reconcile. Reconcile was created in 2003 by the former New Sudan Council of Churches as a faith-based ecumenical peace-building organization for communities to heal from their brokenness after five decades of war. Starting from its center in Ye, South Sudan, and reaching out across the nation and into neighboring countries, Reconcile equips grassroots, religious, and government leaders to restore hope and rebuild lives by means of three different programs. Through the Leadership and Governance Program, with its comprehensive curriculum of skills enhancing courses, Reconcile plays an intricate but often quiet role as these leaders learn how to negotiate clashes from among clans, political factions, military forces, and government leaders within embattled communities. In a variety of activities, from personal to peer counseling to sports activities and reconciliation forums, the Psychosocial Rehabilitation Program restores individuals and interpersonal relationships that have endured emotional wounds from conflict. The Reconcile Peace Institute offers a comprehensive three-month training to recommended leaders to equip them with vital skills necessary for facilitating trauma recovery and conflict transformation in their places of influence. RPI's instructors include highly trained experts from Africa, Europe, and the United States of America who are committed to contextualizing their knowledge in a manner which is accessible and practical. As a result, graduates become part of a vast network of peace builders across the country and various ethnic groups, social economic backgrounds, genders, ages, and educational levels. As a longtime PCUSA partner, Reconcile has also trained Presbyterian leaders to better address healing within their own communities and congregations. Reverend Ojulu Omo is one of them. While he was taking his final course at RPI, his village was attacked, home raided, cattle stolen, and father shot. Enraged family members and villagers considered a revenge attack and asked him to return to protect his family. 
Ajulu, however, knew that revenge would only temporarily satisfy his anger. But lessons learned at Reconcile could change his community forever. Four years later, he is an ordained Presbyterian pastor who's worked extensively in his community, resolving conflict and counseling war survivors in the refugee camps of Gambela, Ethiopia, where many are traumatized. Reconcile's peace-building efforts have become widely recognized from state officials and ecumenical platforms to diplomatic circles and international news agencies. We're thankful for the active participation of the PCOS in all three programs of Reconcile and for the church's contributions in the forms of personal resources through Reconcile staff and Board of Governance. I Thanks. hope you're as inspired That's as I am by the courageous women and men who lead these efforts of the Presbyterian Church of South Sudan. Thanks. If you might have, it kind of went by quickly, but you might have heard the word PICOS. Picos. So that is uh, just an acronym. Mission Agency loves acronyms just as much as the federal government. So PICOS is the Presbyterian Church of South Sudan. Uh, and you can see, you know, the partnership that um, Mission builds with um, you know, the church and the local missionaries and, and us. So um, the next slide uh, is a prayer. We can, we can pray for this offering. O oh God of peace, we embrace your joy and go forth to connect with others in building a world where all can find compassion, peace, and justice. Amen. So the if we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. You can uh, give your offering on October 2nd. You can give online. There's a drop-down menu on the Shepherd website. Or um, whenever it moves you, we'll collect this. Uh, just put peacemaking offering on your check or in your envelope. And thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne come to our time of communion and start with prayers of joys and concern. Uh, a joy and concern is that uh, our congregation is very responsive to need, uh, particularly to some of the big concerns that we face. And yesterday I met with uh, our administrator, Paul Enneking, Suzanne Sheets, and also um, Elder Alice Gentry, uh, the three of them came up with a great way to respond to the mosquito fire, and particularly evacuees who are now at Sierra College. There is a sheet that's out in the narthex that you can pick up, tangible ways to support the evacuees who are just over at, at the college. Um, some of them just include uh, volunteering 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. each day. We can check in, it's parking lot B, all this information is here. Um, we've uh, also told folks that they can enjoy the labyrinth and uh, the memorial prayer garden. Uh, meet, may need some uh, time of solace in this time. Uh, gift cards are, are needed for Safeway and um, uh, food and gas, of course. Um, toiletries and other necessities. Now, food donations. Alice just got word this morning that snacks, just every day can good snacks uh, are really essential right now, so you can, you can do that. Um, there's a daily need for ice, um, and all of this will collect at the office if you do not want to or cannot go to parking lot B over at Sierra College. We'll collect them in the office, and we'll bring these things over on Tuesday and Wednesday. Just to let you know, too, um, that our North Car California Central Presbytery is sending us uh, some money that we are going to use uh, to support evacuees of the mosquito fire. So that's very good. We know where some of our per capita dollars go, right? <laughs> and um, we are also uh, noted, uh, one of the ways that you can donate if you don't want to bring tangible goods is through uh, the Placer County, I'm going to get this wrong, um, fund, community fund. Is that right, Suzanne? Where'd you go? 
Foundation, thank you, Fun Foundation, thank you. Um, all of this information is here, will be emailed out to you this week. Just a good tangible way to respond to a great need in our local area. So thank you to Paul and Suzanne and Alice for getting all this started. All right, uh, for prayers and, uh, and concerns, uh, we are praying for the people of Haiti in the midst of chaos and collapse, corrupt government, leadership, ongoing violence, collapse of the economy following a series of hurricanes and national disasters. Um, so we're praying for our fellow Christians and all people of Haiti um, that they might feel uh, tangible evidence of God's love that comes from Virgil. Thank you, Virgil. Uh, Ken Winters lifting up prayers for Lindy and Brian Barkley. Um, Lindy is, is struggling with AFib. Um, uh, actually, both, both of them are. So we'll pray for Lindy and Brian. Ellen Brown is lifting up prayers for all of those dealing with the fires in this time. Um, and she says, the, the bad news is time flies. The good news is we're the pilots. And I pilot mine with a joystick. That you do, Ellen. Yes. Uh, Virgil is also requesting prayers uh, for the women of Shepherd as they close their retreat this morning um, and that they might have new and deeper relationships and traveling mercies as they return home. Uh, Jerry's praying for the people of Ukraine, but especially her American friend Sam, who is in St. Petersburg, of all places, working to help the people of Ukraine. Les Huber is requesting prayers for Steve Wright at a procedure on Saturday, um, and so we're, um, and today he's also having his gall gallbladder removed, so we're praying for Steve Wright. And uh, we have also, um, oh yes, Sue Bordelon is letting us know that we really need to go appreciate some of the new artwork that is in our narthex. Many thanks to the Pioneer uh, Quilt Guild for their talent and creativity. Uh, the exhibit is called Nature's Bounty, and it will be with us through November 22nd. Thank you for setting that up, Sue, and uh, please enjoy uh, that wonderful artwork. Okay. Let us turn our attention to the table of communion. And Jesus invites us here. Of course, he na neither forces or coerces us to come to this table. He says, Come. And receive nourishment for the journey of faith. We are welcomed to eat bread and wine, which is the grain of the earth, the fruit of the vine. And we remember in doing this that God sustains us for the life of faith. All are welcome to participate in communion. It is Christ who invites us to join him, meet him here. Let us pray. God of our salvation, you are faithful even when we want not to be. You were with your people in the wilderness and remained even when they deserted you. You came in Christ Jesus knowing that you would be rejected. Your spirit is ever before us even when we turn away. All thanks to you, O God, for your steadfast love. In gratitude, we take our bread and our cup, remembering all good gifts come from you. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that by this meal we share here and in our homes, Christ may abide in us. Make us alive in the Spirit, fill us with faith, energize us with hope, and empower us to love others as you have loved us. And remember your church, scattered upon the face of the earth, gather it in unity and preserve it in truth. Make us one body bound by your great love. And we lift up the joys and concerns of these, your people, in the assurance that you hear all of our prayers. We pray this morning for Mary Wire Albright. We are thankful for the continued healing of Corinne Fowler. For the people of South Sudan and the persecuted of India. We're praying for Susie Boley, who has COVID in this time. Pray for the people who are affected by the mosquito fire. May we serve to see, serve them well, seek to serve them well. Uh, we are grateful for the creativity of artists who inspire us uh, to uh, learn more about your creation and appreciate it more. We're grateful for nature's bounty. 
Uh, we pray for Steve Wright, uh, that he would good procedure today and also good and fast recovery. Pray for the people of Ukraine, especially for Sam in St. Petersburg. We pray for peace, recon reconciliation. We pray for uh, members at uh, Shepherd who are finishing up their retreat just now. And we are asking that all of the, the new relationships and uh, the good the worship that has been done this weekend uh, might uh, be lasting in, in our church. And we're grateful for the joy that you do give to each of us. Pray for Lindy and Brian Barkley. Ask that you would uh, grant them the strength and healing. We also pray for the people of Haiti. We pray for peace. We pray for good solutions and good leadership and for our ongoing concern. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after breaking it, he gave thanks, and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is poured out for many. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. This is the cup of salvation and the bread of life. Every time you eat and drink of it, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. And so now I invite the communion servers to come forward, and once they are in place, we invite the congregation forward, beginning from the very back. Uh, those who cannot make it forward, please do raise your hand, and servers will come to you. Please know that at the communion tables, uh, there is a gluten-free option. Please partake in com as the communion servers will offer you the bread of life and cup of salvation. All right. There you go, Cheryl. Do I need this cup, Gosh? Yep. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray, friends. God of grace, we thank you for this supper. We thank that it, you that it is shared in the spirit of the risen Christ, and we are grateful for the grace that you extend to us here, and that you extend everywhere that this supper is shared. And may it give strength to us and encourage us to live with intention and integrity in our world. Amen. Let us stand and sing our faith. That's as good a benediction as any. We had all our courageous clappers out there, too. Very good. Well, friends, let us live with renewed intention. And resolve to live with integrity. Let us leave this place encouraged. To love God, neighbor, and ourselves. And may you know the love of God and rest in the grace of Jesus Christ, and may you be moved by the Spirit. Let us join in singing shalom, and children, you may, if you would like to come up and sing shalom. Shalom. 